Hello. So in this video, we're talking about academic writing. It's the kind of writing you have to do in college, and it has very specific features or qualities that you can come to know and understand. It's not natural. It's not the kind of writing you do outside of any other kind of setting. But for our purposes, to be successful in college, it's the kind of writing you have to learn to do. And that's what we're practicing all semester. So what I want to do in this video for you is talk to you about what exactly academic writing is and what exactly an academic paragraph looks like. So let's get started. First, what exactly is academic writing? First of all, it's always planned and focused. All right, you always have to do a lot of planning to get it to work. A good academic writing always addresses a problem. And sometimes that problem is simply a question you have to answer, but it's a problem. You have to address a problem. And it always demonstrates an understanding of the subject. Whoever writes academically understands what they're talking about in a way that makes readers appreciate it. So that's one thing. Secondly, it's always very coherent, meaning all the parts hold together. And it's written in a logical order. And it brings a lot of different related points to material into one place. So that usually takes drafts. It's always based on evidence. So it's never just opinion. It's never just what you feel. It's always based on evidence that people will agree it counts as evidence. So it always demonstrates knowledge of a subject area. It supports positions with evidence. Like if you have a view, it's because the evidence says you should have that view. And there's always a really clear connection between the evidence and where it comes from. Your opinion, the evidence, and where it comes from that's referenced accurately. And that's why in academic writing use a lot of citations. And of course, it always has a very high level of specific detail. In other words, you can't just generally say what you mean. You have to be very specific about what you mean. And usually, you should be more specific than you even realize you should be. It's also very formal in tone and style, right? It uses a formal language. It's very clear and concise and balanced. It doesn't use slang or familiar language. It never uses words like you in it because you is very informal and you would never do that, right? But it does not require the use of long sentences and complicated vocabulary. You might think it does, but it does not. It does not. And then finally, it's objective meaning it aims to treat information in an objective and relatively impersonal manner. It tries to pre present information in factual terms, not in personal terms. Like subjective means your experience of it. So you wouldn't really write about experience of an idea. You would write about what is the idea, how you define it, how do people understand it, very, very objective in tone, which is why you generally get told not to use things like I, the pronoun I in the paper, because that kind of makes it more personal. You definitely never use you. You try not to use I. In fact, you try to only use like he, she, and they. And then keep it there, right? So that's generally what academic writing is. But what does an academic paragraph look like? And we're going to look at one right now. So I'm going to show you one I took from a student paper. So here's a paragraph I'm going to read to you. There's only uh, seven sentences in it. And uh, one of them is kind of long. Most of them aren't. But it's very clear. Again, it comes from a paper of a student I used to have. So here we go. This paper is about how pornography is bad for teenagers and how it affects their brains and it uses a book called the shallows it's about how the brain is affected by the internet so there's one paragraph in that paper so one reason i'm reading the paragraph now one reason that adolescents are especially susceptible to the hindering effects of pornography is the plasticity of the adolescent's brain that is the teenage brain is quick to be shaped and reshaped by repeated stimuli nicholas carr in his book the shallows discusses the consistent malleability of the adult brain, despite the common belief that the brain's plasticity ends with childhood. While Carr acknowledges that with neuroplasticity, the scientific term for the way the brain is reshaped by experience, childhood is, fundamentally, is fundamental to how we develop. He points out that research shows the brain actually continues to grow and change throughout adolescence. Carr states, that the brain's plasticity is universal in virtually all of our neural circuits, quote, whether they're involved in feeling, seeing, hearing, moving, thinking, learning, perceiving, or remembering are subject to change. In other words, teenagers can change their brains as well as their personalities in ways that can prove especially harmful. And the one way that is significant is the easy access on the web to pornography. So that's one paragraph out of a, out of a paper that uses some research from this book. Seven sentences. So what I want to do now is actually break it down. As I said, there are seven sentences. This is each one is numbered. And what I'm going to do next is talk about each sentence individually. Okay, so let's start with the first one. So first sentence, 
One reason adolescents are especially susceptible to the hindering effects of pornography is the plasticity of the adolescent's brain. This is what's called the topic sentence. The topic sentence is the main idea of the paragraph, and it's stated clearly and with very specific language. Notice it's not a question, it's not a quote, it's the writer's own idea, making it very clear this is what the entire paragraph is going to be about. All right? Very clear. And every paragraph should have a topic sentence. It should have one in the body of the Bible. You need to have that. Now look at sentence two. That is, the teenage brain is quick to be shaped and reshaped by repeated stimuli. This sentence offers what's called an elaboration. It elaborates to give more specifics. All right, so it offers an elaboration of the main idea of the topic sentence. In other words, it gives readers more information about the topic and perhaps even states the idea in clearer language. Follow that? Notice, I use the sentence in other words right here. And this number two uses words that is. That is says, and another way of saying it is what that means, the word that is. So the second sentence is explaining a little further and a little clearer what the first sentence says. That's called an elaboration sentence. It's really good to do that. Explain your idea further. Number three. Number three, Nicholas Carr, in his book, The Shallows, discusses the consistent malleability of the adult brain, despite the common belief that the brain's plasticity ends with childhood. This is where the paragraph brings in specific evidence. It names the source, Nicholas Carr, The Shallows, and the key idea that the source addresses, all right? Now, malleability means changeability, like clay is malleable, you can reshape it, right? And what it's saying is the brain is malleable. All right, so this is coming right out of car. And this sentence is pointing out how the brain in the adult is malleable, even though most people believe it ends in childhood, okay? But it is specific evidence, and it brings the source in. It goes on with more of the source, number four. While Carr acknowledges that with neuroplasticity, the scientific firm, term for the way the brain is reshaped by experience, child is fundamental how we develop, he points out the research shows that the brain actually continues to grow and change throughout adolescence. That's not childhood anymore, right? So here the idea of number three, sentence number three is explained in more detail. This is an elaboration on number three, right? The writer even uses the source as naysayer. A naysayer is the voice that's opposite of the one you think. So the voice that's opposite of the source says that childhood is where we get our brain plasticity. He says he acknowledges that's true, but it actually continues in the adolescence. So he challenges that opposite force, that naysayer. We're gonna learn about that later. Number five, Carr states that the brain's plasticity is universal and virtually all of our neural circuits, whether they're involved in feeling, seeing, hearing, moving, thinking, learning, perceiving, remembering, are subject to change. That's a quote, and it gives you a citation, Carr 26. Here the writer offers a key quote from the source. This quote isn't obvious or boring, but instead is central to the argument of the paragraph. So you want to always pick a quote that's really important to your argument, not just really obvious. And sometimes we tend to pick obvious quotes and you gotta stop doing that, right? Second thing is it's, it's cited in the citation. Notice the period comes after the citation. Now I wanna go back a second, but look at number three. Notice there's no quote here, but there's a citation. This, these words, this idea comes from page 22, but it's the writer's, the paper writer's words. So the writer paraphrased the original, but it's still the original idea. So that's why it gets a citation. So you have to remember to cite paraphrases as well as quotes, all right? And again, notice the period comes after the citation. All right, so, sorry, wrong way. So we just saw number five. So number six, number five is when you get a quote. You follow me? Now look at number six. In other words, Teenagers can change their brains as well as their personalities in ways that can prove especially harmful. So I want you to notice that in this sentence, the writer explains the quote, showing the reader exactly what the writer wants the reader to understand about the quote. Okay, quotes don't speak for themselves. So after you quote something, then you want to explain it in your own words. What exactly is important about that quote? And you can start literally with something like, in other words, it's a way of saying, let me restate that quote for you in a way I want you to understand it. And then paragraph uh, sentence seven. And the one way that is significant is the easy access on the web to poor pornography. Here the writer concludes by pointing readers to the real purpose of the paragraph. This last sentence, the concluding sentence, doesn't just restate what the paragraph says. It tells us, well, what's this whole paragraph's point? Why does it matter? Why should I care? Why should I care? Because it's all about the easy access to the pornography can really hurt teenagers' brains. And that goes to the next paragraph. All right. 
So what I want you to notice now is a few things. So I have to summarize, good academic writing looks like this. It starts with a topic sentence, a sentence that's the main point of the paragraph. It's never a question or a quote. It's a claim. It's a sentence that states something. Then there's an elaboration, which gives more detail about the topic sentence. Then it gives evidence, and that could be two or three sentences or four. It mentions sources. It gives paraphrases and or quotes. Generally, it's either facts from a source, testimony from a source, or reasoning. And then there's an explanation of the quote or paraphrase. That's the writer stepping in and saying, here's what I want you to understand about that quote. And then a concluding sentence that points out what's most important about the paragraph, stresses why the paragraph matters. And you really want to make sure your readers understand that. That's how you do an academic paragraph. Best of luck to you.